About 50 years ago, an astronaut returning from the moon experienced things that he couldn't find a scientific explanation for. So, with some colleagues, he launched a new science focused on the mind and how it works in the body and across space and time. It's the field of noetics, where the tools of modern science are used to help us understand how what we think and feel affects us and the world around us. Now, this is Dr. Ruth Miller's Noetic Moments from the studios of KXCR Community Radio in Florence, Oregon. This is Noetic Moments, where we explore the field of research that discovers what consciousness is, what it does, how it works, and how our lives could be very different if we understood it better. I am Ruth Miller, a longtime student of consciousness, cybernetics, and anthropology, and through this series of programs, I'm introducing some of the people whose work has defined this field of research, and I'm explaining some of their ideas and experiments. I'll also explore some relevant news items and answer questions that you send to my email address, ruth at noeticmoments.org, and noetic is spelled N-O-E-T-I-C. Well, since we began this series of programs, we focused on the various models that people have developed to explain our mental and emotional experience and the experiments that have supported or extended those models. From the earliest scientific explorations, we learned that most of what goes on in the mind is not in our conscious awareness at all, but goes on in unconscious processes. Therefore, consciousness is much more than awareness. From these early researches, we learned that our minds can be thought of as having three aspects. What we're aware of, what we're calling our personal awareness, What we aren't aware of that's keeping our bodies going and also includes our fears and our beliefs about potential threats and dangers, which we'll call the individual subconscious, and what we aren't aware of that enlivens our beings and guides us in our actions, which we can call the individual superconscious. From later research, we learned that we can change our state of consciousness and shift what aspects of minds we are aware of and what we're capable of in the moment. And we learned that while it's possible to say where in the brain various processes are active, no one has yet been able to say where in the brain various processes are actually unfolding, where the memories are stored, or what the pathway by which ideas and thoughts happen. We also saw that responses in our body to both our individual mental activity, our thoughts and feelings, and to what's going on around us happen far faster than nerve impulses or chemicals can travel through the body. So it's become clear that who and what we are, our consciousness, our decisions and our choices are not all originating in the brain. As a result, many scientists have come to accept that what we call mind is not the product of the electrochemical activity of the brain, but is in fact the activity of a kind of field that surrounds and permeates the whole body, which some researchers and teachers of ancient traditions, like those we call shamans, have suggested looks like a glowing egg shapes extending from below our knees to a few inches above our heads. This field appears to be at least partly electromagnetic because it's possible to measure electromagnetic activity for several inches and even several feet around the body. These researchers suggest that the brain is best understood as a receiver transmitter. It receives messages from the mind and transmits them to the body and receives messages from the senses and transmits them to the body and mind. We also learned that the brain modifies whatever it receives from both the senses and the mind to fit past patterns of experience that are stored as hardwired connections among the neurons, following Begg's principle that, quote, neurons that fire together wire together, end quote, in something that is usually called the default network which means we see and hear and feel what we expect or believe we will experience. 
Other experiments that we looked at demonstrated that what we call the individual mind continues to perceive and process for as much as several hours, even when the brain and heart are flatlined, and the person has been declared dead. Now, this may explain why most reports from those who've been through those experiences that are usually called near-death experiences, even though they're actually declared dead, why their reports do not fit the patterns of expectation that were stored in their brain's neuronal connections and are almost impossible for them to find language to adequately describe. Mind, then, is a field a pattern of energy that exists during and after the body is functioning. That aspect of mind is what we've been calling the superconscious. Mind that permeates and develops with the body and the brain is what we call the subconscious. And it's being told by the sensory parts of the brain what the world out there is like as our personal awareness. Now, every field is a unique pattern of vibration that's different from other fields. And some experiments have demonstrated that people and some animals have minds that are vibrating along similar patterns. They resonate with each other. Such resonant minds are able to sense when the other is focusing attention on them or is about to come home. Their bodies have been measured to change in subtle ways when someone they're connected with turns attention their way, even though they can't be seen or heard. Learning this, we begin to understand how bodies and environments can shift and change as people change their thought processes, what they're focusing on in the personal awareness part of their consciousness. It also explains the effectiveness of things like spiritual healing or mental healing and what's called the placebo effect, how the belief of a care provider in a treatment and the belief of the patient in that treatment can help a patient receiving that treatment experience a degree of healing. And we've also learned that mind does affect matter in a variety of ways. There's a lot of talk about the famous double-slit experiments in quantum physics where particles or energy may show up as particles or energy depending on whether a mind is present to observe them. And the collective human mind has been demonstrated to change the readouts on random number generators on the network of computers run by the Global Consciousness Project in Princeton. Because of the nature of fields and because of things like the Global Consciousness Project, a growing number of scientists are seeing our individual field of mind as part of a larger field, a collective consciousness, a nuosphere, or a global brain. And more and more scientists are equating that larger field with the zero point or quantum field out of which all matter and energy arises in this orderly system we call the universe. And this field has been called the Akashic field, using a Sanskrit term that means, quote, the essence of everything that exists in the material world, end quote. And some scientists are beginning to use the equations that describe standard laws of physics and computer learning algorithms to describe the role of consciousness in the formation of our material world. And this reinforces the idea that has become rather popular, that thoughts are a creative force in our experience. So, based on all of that, we began to explore some more popular explorations of how the mind works in our world, including what's called the law of attraction, how the world around us reflects what we've been focusing on, and the way that we can access information from that quantum or Akashic field through insight, intuition, and the increasingly understood process of channeling and through dreams and the dreaming process as it affects the body and relates to our greater individual consciousness and the collective consciousness. And we also looked at the way music affects the brain and the body and influences how individual minds connect with other mind fields. You can catch up on all of this information on our past shows on our website, www.noeticmoments.org. 
where you'll also find links to the clips and books and authors that I mention on the show. Well, now that we've pretty much established that mind affects matter, and particularly that it affects our bodies, we're spending a few weeks now on the healing process. A couple of weeks ago, we heard about how health and wellness need to be thought of in terms of much more than the body. We also learned that a few minutes spent in the elevated emotion of gratitude for several days in a row leads to great improvements in the chemicals and the cellular functioning of the immune system. And last week, I explained some of the mechanism by which all that happens. This week, I want to continue to explore, within the framework of noetics, how healing the body by mental activity is not only possible, but actually happens pretty frequently. I ended last week's presentation with the line, quote, Our job in healing is to create a field in which the matter that makes up our body can be restored to its natural, balanced, fully functioning state. So I thought today we'd look at some ways to do that. One of the first things that comes up when people are looking at how to restore balance to the body is how do we breathe? I remember during a time when I was dealing with a major health challenge, someone looked at me and said, you know, you really do have permission to breathe. I had learned to breathe very, very shallowly as a child. So I had to learn how to breathe fully, to fill the chest and allow the diaphragm to expand and then allow that breath to move out. Yes, breathing in a nice, deep, full way is one of the ways that we restore balance in the body. When we breathe shallowly or quickly, when we breathe shallowly and quickly, we're actually reducing the amount of oxygen and other nutrients that might be moving through the bloodstream supporting our cells. This is telling the body that there isn't enough, and so the body is sending out hormones to tell the cells to behave in a different way than they would normally behave in their healthy body. So when we take long, slow, deep breaths, we are beginning the process of restoring balance in the body. And when we allow ourselves to breathe fully regularly, we are actually contributing on a regular basis to the balance of the body. So breath work is the first step. And there is more that you can do because different forms of breath work actually affect the body in different ways. You may have seen some of the work where yogis are breathing through one nostril or another or Buddhist meditators are breathing through one nostril or another to help restore balance. Or you may have heard of the concept of holotropic breath work that is designed to undo the past patterns of breathing and allow new patterns. Breath work is a very powerful first step in beginning to restore the balance so that the body can restore itself to its fully functioning state. The next step is what is variously called imagery or visualization. Back in the 70s and 80s, Carl Simonton began to make this popular as his patients were learning to imagine things in their bodies turning around the symptoms they were experiencing. For example, there was the young child who began to see the white blood cells in his body becoming these marvelous knights, and they were wiping out the cancer cells in his body. And then there was a book called Psychoneuroimmunology, in which the author described using imagery or visualization to see molecules of calcium and appropriate minerals coming bit by bit to the parts of his spine that had been crushed and restored the health of his body. Joe Dispenza says that he used visualization to help restore his body after a major motorcycle accident. Another use of visualization is to see the body whole and healthy, to imagine walking and running and playing and skiing and doing all the things one loves to do with joyful abandon. There have been a number of studies done, and one of the most famous is of basketball players. A team was divided into three groups. One practiced regularly, as they always had. One 
used the same time that they had been practicing on the court to visualize, imagine themselves playing and shooting the baskets and dribbling the balls and passing the balls. And then the other group did whatever they would normally do instead of practicing. The fascinating results of this study, as it has been reported many, many times in places, is that the people who visualized and imagined themselves and felt themselves as if they were playing on the courts ended up being just as well prepared for the games as those who were actually on the courts. It turns out, and we've talked a little bit about this, that what we imagine fully, the body system thinks we've done. And therefore, if you want to experience a healthy body, an important thing to do is to imagine fully with feelings, with as many sensations as you can, seeing and hearing and tasting and smelling and feeling the motions and feeling the air and feeling the textures and the, all those things imagining fully having had an experience is just as powerful as far as the body is concerned as having that experience. Another approach that has been remarkably powerful is laughter that goes along with gratitude and joy. Now, we did hear a few weeks ago from Joe Dispenza how his experiments have demonstrated that a few minutes in the elevated state of deep gratitude for whatever, doesn't matter what, is able to enhance the immune system by as much as 50%. He also points out that joy and bliss and other what he calls elevated emotions can have a similar effect. It's just that gratitude is easier to grab hold on, if you will, in day-to-day -day living. Laughter can be one of those elevated emotions. And humor, looking at things humorously, can turn around what has been a very distressing situation. I'm going to let someone who's been horribly tormented in her teen years, explain what her understanding of that is. My senior year research project was about the link between comedy and mental health. Today, I want to share with you some of the things that I learned while doing that project. In a research survey conducted among heterosexual couples, people showed a higher romantic affinity for individuals who could make them laugh. Now, there is a caveat here. Early humor research has shown that there are two different types of humor. Adaptive and maladaptive. Adaptive humor is self-affirming and self-enhancing, while maladaptive humor is self-defeating and detrimental. The UNC study showed that a negative correlation between maladaptive humor and social desirability. This is to say, humor that is self-deprecating made an individual less appealing to their peers. Now, psychological research has shown across the board that adaptive humor styles have the most beneficial effects. One study by the University of Vienna concluded that maladaptive humor styles correlated with a negative self-esteem and lower quality of life. Now, I'm not sharing this with you to say that you should not laugh at yourself, only to say that you should laugh at yourself in a productive way. Take my KKK story, for example. My race or skin color wasn't the punchline of the joke. The KKK is the punchline, and I use that punchline as a means of coming to terms with my identity in a humorous way. I want to leave you with this. A research study at Texas A&M found that there is a positive link between having a sense of humor and your psychological and physical well-being. It also concluded that people with a sense of humor have more hope for the future than their humorless peers. This is the pinnacle of my message here, hope. If there's anything you take away from this speech, let it be this. Every single person in the world has some sort of trauma. No one is exempt from this universal human experience. The less emotional energy expended over it, the better. You can mentally agonize over every little thing that happens to you, or you could joke. Jokes are a shortcut to the elemental truth that suffering is inevitable. From her perspective, having practiced comedy as a way to deal with her own trauma, she went out and did a bunch of research and learned that having a sense of humor or being able to create jokes is a powerful process for undoing the symptoms that may be resulting from any kind of emotional distress or trauma. And, as she points out, being able to laugh, being able to find the humor in situations, 
when that's not self-deprecating and it is not deprecating others can in fact improve the overall health of the body and mind. Well, that was one of the findings that my co-author and I wrote about in our book, Calm Healing. Robert Bruce Newman, a longtime student of Tibetan masters, Tibetan lamas, and I wrote a book in which we talked about the power of humor, among other things, as a healing process. The other things were really what we were talking about, and that is the fourth method that we can use to help to restore the body, and that is what are called meditation methods. Now, meditation is a scary word in our culture because many people think they can't meditate. All meditation means is finding a way to stop the normal default structure in the brain. You can do this by sewing or gardening or running or swimming or chanting a mantra or, in time, sitting and focusing on your breathing and allowing the body to relax and feel the depth of possibility in the body. In the book Calm Healing, Robert and I were able to find all kinds of techniques, many of which he had learned from Tibetan lamas, and to find a fair amount of research supporting those ways that those techniques help heal the body. The first several chapters are, in fact, about those techniques. We wrote this in 2005. It was published in 2006 by North Atlantic Books. As we went into this book, What we did is we talked about meditation as mind-body medicine. In the first chapter, we talked about the period of the development of mind-body medicine, which really was peaking in the 70s. And we talked about meditation methods across different cultures, not just Eastern, but also Western, and then meditation research in the United States, in which we found that people who meditated had lower blood pressure, increased overall well-being, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of details in this book on that subject. In the second part, we began to look at what a new model for healing might be, states of consciousness, and we've talked about that on this show, And then we looked at a new model of the body for this new era of medicine. And the model of the body we were working with agrees with what we've been saying here in the model of the mind, and that is that the brain is not where it all happens. Also, that the body is not just matter, that the body is not just electrochemical interactions. And so we talked about the different fields that make up the body and how different kinds of meditations affect the fields, which led to Chapter 6, A New Model of the Healing Process. The third part addressed healing methods. Within the realm of meditation, there are different kinds of methods that can be used. One of them is what Robert liked to call cardio awareness healing systems. This is where we are using the breath and our awareness to open our heart and feel the heart energy and the loving energy helping to restore balance in the organ that is the heart. Another one is progressive neuromuscular release. Now, many of you who have attempted meditation will be familiar with this. This is where you start out feeling your toes tense and then release them, your foot tense and release them, etc. As you're in a relaxed body state, breathing fully and regularly. That helps to restore the muscular balance in the body. Chapter 9, Awareness-Based Energy Breathing. This is something I continue to use a lot when I am leading meditations. And basically, it's acknowledging that every time we breathe air in, we're also breathing more of the energy of the quantum field. And that energy is moving through energy systems within the body. Some of you have heard the terms chakras and nadis. And those are part of what helps the body to function. So as you do awareness-based energy breathing, then you are helping to restore balance in that way. Then we talk about some 
applications, particularly in childbirth, because that's where Robert Newman's work is focused. And then we used a method that I helped develop called Healing the Present by Healing the Past, in which we use guided imagery and a number of other techniques to help us restore balance by letting go of the pain of the past. Chapter 13, The Healing Practice of Humor, and Chapter 14, Healthcare Methods for the Semi-Comatose and for Near-Death Care, which draws heavily on the Tibetan book of The Dying. Part 4 offers a new model for how we can be living, healing the person, healing the planet, and the genius of self-care using these methods and some explanations of the ideas that we used. So Calm Healing, Methods for a New Era of Medicine by Robert Bruce Newman and Ruth L. Miller. Well, I was going to talk about some other things today, but we are out of time already. Who knew? So I'll share those with you at our next show. We are out of time for today, but remember, you can always continue the exploration just by going to our website, noeticmoments.org, and noetic is spelled N-O-E-T-I-C, and as we get together next time, we'll look more at the research being done in an attempt to understand what consciousness is, what it does, and how our lives can be very different when we use it fully. For now, thanks for joining me here on Noetic Moments, recorded in the studios of KXCR Community Radio in Florence, Oregon. And have a wonderful week. You've been listening to Dr. Ruth Miller's Noetic Moments. This program is produced in the studios of KXCR Community Radio in beautiful Florence, Oregon, supported by you, our listeners. Our theme music is Tumbling Planets, composed and performed by Jeff Lovejoy. To hear this program again or learn more about Noetic Sciences, search our website, www.noeticmoments.org.